Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Tuesday Tip. We're talking discretionary policies today under HOTMA. And as you know, these policies are essential for multifamily housing owners, for you to understand them and implement them. And so, Vicki, uh, can you give us a brief overview of HOTMA and explain why these discretionary policies are so important? Yes, the discretionary policies are important because they provide multifamily owners with the flexibility of implementing certain provisions that are in HOTMA. And uh, in essence, the HOTMA discretionary policies are designed to give the owners and agents the necessary tools they need to manage their property with the new changes. Um, they're a critical component of the HOTMA program, and there are several that are listed and quite important, I would say. Okay. And if you want to follow along, you can get this HUD document about the discretionary policies. Just scan the QR code on your screen because that's what we're going to be referencing throughout today's conversation. So, Vicki, let's talk about the asset limitation policy for new admissions under okay. HOTMA. We're talking new admissions, right? Yes, we're talking new admissions and we're talking annual research and interims. The discretionary policy has it divided into two groups. So let's talk about the new admissions first. Um, there are certain things that people who are applying that are not already in the property, new admissions have to do. Number one, they can't have assets over $100,000 or real property that they have ownership, but it's unsuitable for occupancy. And what I mean by that is that they may have a home or have interest in a home. There's a certain criteria as to whether that will count against them as a new admitted person to the program or not. Uh, we talked briefly, you and I did last week about that a little. Mm -hmm. A person can have a disability. They can be total owner or they could be a partial owner, let's say with a brother or sister in a piece of property, but they have a disability and the property does not, uh, it's not good for their disability. There are a lot of steps and they're wheelchair bound and things of that nature. But not only the disability part, it could be that the property is located in another state. Mm -hmm. So that can't count against a new applicant. Or it could be that they don't have total ownership, like the brother and sister have an equal share, inherited the property, the sister has applied, she's an applicant, but her brother doesn't want to sell the property. There's okay. nothing that she could do about that or force him to sell, so that asset can't count against her. Okay. So we see it here that it says no discretion in enforcement. Why is that? Why is there no discretion allowed for owners in enforcing this policy? Well. HUD says that there's no discretion, but there's a little. It's according to how you basically look at it. Okay. Um, the owners may choose to use what we call full toll enforcement. And under toll enforcement, the owners and agents may choose to um, write in the policy about the discretions for the limitation on real property, the toll enforcement, the real property requirement is there, and so is the anything else that will total up to 100. But there's nothing in paragraph 4, 5, and 6 of section 104 of HOTMA that compels the multifamily owners to exercise the discretion provided in the statute. So they have a little bit of discretion in order to write a policy for applicants, as well as for their existing tenants. And so we were going to talk about how they incorporate this into their tenant selection plan, but you've kind of touched on that already. Okay. Uh, also remember that there's toll enforcement, there's toll non-enforcement, where the owners and the agents may choose to establish a real written policy, and it has limitations. Uh, for all properties or for all families at uh, annual and interim recertifications. They might have um, 
they have existing residents. They might have something that says existing residents do this, but new applicants do that. And that's what I contribute to mm -hmm. being not totally enforceable. You know, it's according to how they write their tenant selection plans and what's included. And the last but not least of them is that the families can also have what they call limited enforcement. And limited enforcement or limited non-enforcement policies must be addressed uh, by the time frame of curing. Uh, if the owner agent decides that they want everybody in the property under the $100,000 rule or the real property rule, then they have to give their existing residents time to what we call cure. And okay. HUD has suggested that time is six months, to give them six months to cure, meaning they have six months to sell the property if they could inhabit it, or they have six months to get their total assets under $100,000. So those are the three things that they have in terms of the assets. Okay. And I've said this before, but I find this very confusing. Everybody so, does. And everybody are, does. <laughs> are we looking at, when we talk about this enforcement, total enforcement, non-enforcement, are we talking mm -hmm. about new admissions versus existing residents and how you're going to apply that policy either equally or separately? No. Okay. New applicants, it's set in stone. Okay. No assets over $100,000, no real property that you could live in instead of HUD paying assistance for you. But that real property still has to go through those three little things that we talked about. If you're disabled, if you own it outright, or if you own it with someone, or if it's in another state. So we're actually saying two things here. We're saying that there is a different set of rules for okay. new applicants. And then in their tenant selection plan, and usually tenant selection plans are for applicants. Okay. But this time HUD says to put into your tenant selection plan how you will handle the existing residents. For instance, can I give you a for instance? Yes, please, okay. please. Great. For instance, we had a gentleman that called last week. He has just moved into a senior property and he sold his house. Okay. His assets are over $100,000. Now, when he moved in, he was aware of HOTMA. But because HOTMA is not in effect and we don't have the software and everything ready, he moved in anyway. So he called last week to say, I'm in here, has anything changed? And we told him, no, nothing has changed yet. He says, well, I have over $100,000. Now, what am I to do? Our suggestion was that he call the manager, since tenant selection plans were supposed to be completed by the 31st, and ask her what's in the tenant selection plan for existing Mm. residents mm -hmm. who are either having an annual or an interim certification. But he didn't get very far because she no. told him that the tenant selection plan was for applicants, and he's not an applicant. He's already a resident, so it does not apply. So like I said, you're not the only one confused. A lot of people are confused. This particular owner is confused because HUD says, according to the discretionary policies, that it will be written into your policy what happens with your existing residents. So it's a lot of work that we still have to do, a lot of things that are going back and forth. Wow. Okay. I think you cleared it up for me <laughs> on that part. But now let's talk about handling de minimis errors. So what constitute a de minimis error in income determinations and how should we handle those? What constitutes the de minimis error is an error in calculating income. Now, it's a good thing. You know, we can't, we can't brag about Hotman for a lot, a lot of things, but there are some good things in Hotman. De minimis errors is one of them. It used to be, or it will be, once we're full-fledged HOTMA, that uh -huh. if there's an error in calculation of a resident's rent, we cannot make it a finding 
unless it's over thirty dollars. Okay. The old way, or what we're on presently, if there's an error of five dollars, we write wow. a finding and we ask them to cure it, to do a research, whatever have you. We establish who is at fault for the error. Did the resident not give all of their income, all of their documents, or was it an error that management made when they were looking at the documents? It really doesn't make any difference. It has to be corrected now. The only thing is that you don't get a finding for it. If it's $10, you still have to correct it, but you won't receive a finding unless it's over $30. If it's $40, you'll receive a finding and you'll still have to cure it or make the correction. So right now it's $5, right? Right now it's any amount. Once okay, HUD, any amount. HUD has hot my full fledged, it will be anything that is over thirty dollars, you'll okay. receive a finding and a correction. Anything under thirty dollars, thirty dollars and under, you won't receive a finding, but you still have to correct it. And that brings us to whose fault it is mm -hmm. and who gets the funds from the correction. If it's the resident's fault and they end up owing management more money, then that's one thing. But if it's management's fault and they end up owing the resident, that's another. If management owes the resident, they are quote unquote supposed to ask the resident how they want their refund. In years past, and it has been, I guess you call an industry, industry standard, that the owners won't refund money to the residents. <laughs> they will tell the residents that we'll give your credit on your next month's rent. Well, HUD says the decision is up to the resident. Do you want okay. your money back now or do you want a credit for the rent? If there are errors uh, of unreported income and it's on the resident's fault or resident side, then they still do a repayment agreement for that. Okay. So let me ask you this. Can I ask you a question? I don't know. It's going to question. <laughs> well, about MORs, how often are you finding de minimis errors that you're, you're issuing findings for these? Is this a common mistake? Well, it is kind of common, but it's not kind of big. And I think okay. that's why... Uh, in the beginning, we said that HOTMA was to clear up a whole lot of paperwork and things that happen in the mm -hmm. industry. Mostly we find things like um, $2, $5. That's not a whole lot of money. It takes $10 or more to make a dollar difference, basically, in the rent. So mm -hmm. whereas they were receiving a finding and still having to make the correction for $5, I guess HUD didn't think it was really, really fair. Because it could be a rounding error. Okay. Yeah, because I was going to say, the way my math is set up, I'd probably have findings all day, Miss Vicky. <laughs> Just tick, 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 tick. It happens sometimes. It happens. It could be the point of um, the decimal point on your adding machine tape mm -hmm. that can cause the error. So management is really, really liking de minimis errors because they don't have to worry about a finding for two dollars. We're really loving it because we don't have to write a finding for two dollars. Yeah, you know. So. I would encourage um, management, the owners and agents, the staff in the office to look at their calculations and make sure that, you know, they stay on top of the errors. Okay. So is there anything else you want to tell us before we uh, talk about what we're going to talk about next week? Okay. I just want to remind everyone that the tenant selection plans were due by the 31st. You're supposed to have them prepared by the 31st. We are not giving a finding if you don't have them. We're giving an observation. So I think my advice to owners and agents and their staff is that they look at their tenant selection plan as they're going through their day-to-day -day work as they admit new people, because they're still admitting new applicants. Just look at your, 
you're admitting them according to your old tenant selection plan. But look at your new tenant selection plan to see if there's anything that needs to be changed or that you understand how it affects that particular applicant that's applying and make those adjustments. There's no finding for making those, adjust, uh, those adjustments. We're just giving an observation if there's something that's all the way to the left opposed to all the way to the right. And mm -hmm. we're all in this together. We're all trying to seek and to do a brand new program. I've been in this business 40 years. And HOTMA is one of the biggest changes that I've seen in my 40 years. I thought EIB was tough, but HOTMA is. Has it beat? I'm just going to say that. <laughs> we love HOTMA. We love HOTMA. Yes, we do. So coming up next week, Ms. Vicki, we're going to finish looking at uh, these discretionary policies. We're going to talk about health and medical care, hardship exemptions, which you say is really deep. It is. Okay. It's a scale, a rolling scale. Wow. So get ready for that. Self-certification of assets, policies on interim reexaminations, and EIV system usage. So that's coming up next week in Tuesday Tip. All right, so how can people get in touch with you, Vicki? They can uh, email me at vbell at navigatehousing.com. I'll be glad to answer any of those questions for you. And be patient with your residents because a lot of them are going through also and trying to find out what to do. Just make sure that you keep them informed of the changes that are coming up. I know that if I were a resident, I would want to know that um, my medical was changing all of a sudden when I signed mm -hmm. my papers. I would want a heads up so I could get my house in order. So it's a, 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 a help one another program. You know, we have to help our residents and in return our residents give us the documents and the help that we need from them and we'll keep the boat afloat. Yes, we will. And of course, again, if you want to get a copy of HUD's discretionary policies, just look on the QR code there on your screen. We also have a page for resources on our website, navigatehousing.com slash HOTMA. And it's navigatehousing.com slash HOTMA if you want to get more information. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Ebony. And we'll see everybody next week.